Welcome back, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Hope you guys are doing well. Just uh, yeah, about three minutes, and then we'll start today's class. So, hope everyone's doing great. Had a good weekend. As usual, you know, feel free to uh, say hello um, or just let me know you're here if you like. But um, yeah, we got three minutes, then we will really jump right in. Hey, Jasmine and Jillian, good to see you guys. Kelly, Alex, Marissa, solid group, good to see everybody. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I did get a haircut, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for the midterm grades, that's going to take me a little longer. The midterm is a little bit of a bigger test, and um, I have a lot of them from not just your class, but from one other. So you got to get me maybe to the end of this week. Uh, but I'll definitely let you know, and I'll do it without delay. Hi, everybody. Good to see you, Nick. Um, nice. Good to see everybody. <clears throat> yeah, there's a, um, you asked about the haircut. There's a place in Long Beach where I live where they have like the, the really good um, fades, you know, like a fade. So, I don't know. It's decent. Cats, they're sleeping. They're kind of just being lazy. Um, so, Flavio, I can never do a backflip. Hey, Clarissa. <clears throat> Hey, Tamara. Um, I got your uh, message, Tamara, also, and um, I think I could help you out with that. Maybe you could let me know what the dates are that you need um, that letter. And then in the email exchange, just give me that info, and then, um, then I can put together a timeline. Hopefully it's not too imminent, that it needs to happen immediately, but uh, you'll let me know. But I'm happy to help. <clears throat> Okay. Great. Okay, everybody. So, uh, yeah, welcome back to class. Glad that we're all here. Um, so let's just kind of uh, take stock of what we've done and where we're headed next. Um, so on Wednesday last week, everybody here took the midterm. That's great. Now that that's done, we proceed to the next chapter of the book. Um, I'm grading the midterms. I'm going through them as quickly as I can. Maybe it will take me... Um, the larger part of this week to finish them, but as soon as I'm done, probably over the weekend, uh, I'll notify everyone, and you can certainly check with me for your score on that, or for any of the other scores, or your grade, uh, grade overall in the class. <clears throat> so, and as usual, you know, let me know if there's any questions, comments, or anything else um, on your mind here in the chat, and I'll take your questions and so on in uh, in real time. Okay, so back to our textbook. The next chapter that we're going to go over is the chapter of the book that deals with fallacies. Now, what's the number of that chapter? Chapter 5. So, <clears throat> fallacies. So, um, and it's good to see everybody there. Hi, Mateo. Sorry for the little issue, um, but we've sorted that out, so a couple times when I see student names, I remember email exchanges that we've had, and it's a good time for me to remind you that I'm in touch. Okay, so fallacies. Um, a major topic in any critical thinking class and basic introduction to logic class like this is inevitably fallacies, something that 
um, can never be overlooked when we study this topic. So first off, I just want to kind of tell you guys what are um, fallacies in the first place. And then we're going to learn about three different categories of them, uh, starting today with what are called fallacies of ambiguity. Okay, so what's a fallacy? A fallacy is what happens when an argument has a logical error or a flaw, um, which makes the argument weak, which makes it so that the premises don't provide the proper support to the conclusion. So it is... When an argument has a logical error or flaw, which causes the premises to not provide the proper support for the conclusion. So there we just see what the idea of a fallacy is. When there's an argument that has a logical error or flaw, and due to that error or due to that flaw, it's a defective argument. So it doesn't um, provide the proper type of support to the conclusion of the argument. So an argument can be weak in many different ways. This class is all about being better critical thinkers, trying to be better at providing arguments, presenting them, and then also being the kind of person that expects to hear a good argument before you're willing to accept statements or information as true. So, you know, discriminating critical thinkers that want to not allow false beliefs to pass into their belief system are always alert to the presence of fallacies. An argument with a fallacy in it is a bad argument, sometimes misleading, sometimes manipulative. And we want to be able to call out and point out when these fallacious arguments are being given because you don't know what a fallacious argument is, then you might actually be convinced by a bad, weak argument into believing something that you really shouldn't be believing. Um, and we also want to be the kind of people who avoid committing fallacies when we state our arguments and our reasons to other people. So knowing these arguments, uh, sorry, knowing what these fallacies are is important information. It's only on the basis of knowing them that you're able to screen for them, that you're able to monitor for them, both in your own um, intellectual behavior and then also in evaluating the claims and information that you get from other people. So we gotta learn about fallacies. Um, now there's three major different categories of fallacies that are talked about in our book. And the one that we're starting with today are called fallacies of ambiguity. So by the time we're done with this topic in chapter five, we'll go over uh, fallacies of ambiguity, fallacies of relevance, and fallacies of unwarranted assumption. And there's going to be a total of 20 fallacies listed in the, in the, uh, in the whole chapter of Chapter 5, um, divided between those three sections of fallacies. So today's main goal is to get into the fallacies of ambiguity. Okay, now let me first of all give you the definition of the fallacies of ambiguity. Um, and then we'll list the particular cases after that. So, fallacy of ambiguity. These are when an argument contains ambiguous words, sloppy grammar, or a confusion between two uh, closely related or similar concepts. Okay, so, this is the one I want. Arguments that contain um, ambiguous words, sloppy grammar, or a confusion between uh, two similar concepts. So 
So that's what fallacies of ambiguity are as a category. They're labeled and named fallacies of ambiguity because there's ambiguity in the argument. The argument contains words that have ambiguous meaning, which perhaps makes it impossible or difficult to interpret. The grammar could be the problem, that we're not sure what is being referred to grammatically in different parts of the argument since it's sloppy. It could also simply be because the argument presents us with concepts that are being confused with each other in an illegitimate way. So this is the type of fallacy that we want to learn about today, and there are um, five members of this group. So that's the general definition of the concept. Now we're going to talk about five specific items that fall within that group. So if this is like the family name, now we're going to meet the members of the fallacy of ambiguity family. Okay, what they all have in common is this definition, but there's five members. So let's talk about them. So in the fallacy of ambiguity fallacy, uh, family rather, you've got these. Equivocation. Um, Amphiboly. No, oh, it isn't the best one. There we go. Much better. Uh, fallacy of accent. And then two more which are kind of like a package deal because they're similar in the sense there's fallacy of division and fallacy of composition. Okay, so good to see everybody. I see you guys there in the chat. Hey, Sebastian and Roger and everyone else. Um, so here's our goal today, to talk in, about these five concepts, define them clearly, and give you guys some examples of them. Um, and then when we move on on Wednesday to the next lecture, we have another category of fallacies, which are called fallacies of relevance. And uh, I think there's seven or eight of those, and then there's seven or eight of the fallacies of unwarranted assumptions. So we're just taking them in batches, first batch of the fallacies of ambiguity today, and there are these five. Um, now, before I just launch into the general discussion of the different fallacies for today, um, I want to go over some of the topics mentioned at the beginning of Chapter 5 by our textbook and the editor. So they start the chapter off. You may remember that when we read Chapter 4, for example, on knowledge, it opened with a little um, reference to some medical errors that were kind of famous cases of medical error. William King got his wrong leg amputated, even though he needed the other leg uh, to be removed. Um, um, they gave too much blood thinning medication to these newborn twins of the actor Dennis Quaid. Um, in chapter three, when we talked about language and communication, that chapter opened up with a little reference to the whole Benghazi scandal and how more effective communication could have facilitated a better outcome there. So in a similar sense, chapter five opens with um, some real world examples of how fallacies can actually be problematic and what can happen in real life when we're not um, wise to the effect of poor and uh, fallacious arguments. So they talk a little bit about people getting caught up in um, cult movements, okay? Like, for example, there's a reference here to a woman named Shannon Townsend. And so it's a true story. Shannon Townsend was an honors high school student. So she's doing great in school academically, and then she got admitted to the University of Colorado, and she was doing very well in her first semester. She's had almost perfect grades, 3.9. GPA. So everything looked like it was going well. But then towards the end of her freshman year, she started getting involved in this mind control kind of cult movement called the Brethren. The Brethren was run by this uh, charismatic cult figure named Jim Roberts. And um, after having been recruited into the Brethren, she cut off all contact with her family and friends, completely abandoned her previous life and became so enveloped in the cult that no one's ever heard from her again. Um, now you might hear her story and think, well, that's pretty wild, but that's like an isolated case. But in, in fact, you know, there's hundreds and even thousands of young people about your age every year that will do similar things, being recruited into dangerous 
cult movements that are organized around excessive devotion to a single person or a single set of ideas. Um, and what cults do in order to recruit people is to use manipulative and deceptive techniques like, for example, fallacious arguments. Um, they prey on young people. Um, they prey on people that are relatively inexperienced in life because, as you guys probably understand, newly uh, you know, reaching your adult age, there's a lot of pressure on you to try and find your own identity. You're struggling with this newfound independence. You know, you've grown up in a household with your parents and family, and now all of a sudden you are expected to be this adult. So there's intense pressure on you to find your way in the world, find a path that works for you, join with certain institutions or organizations and to, to have an identity. And that's a great thing, but sometimes cult movements will prey on the zeal that young people have to, to find their way and find their identity. And they'll use the lack of assertiveness, the dependence on others, the intolerance for ambiguity um, to get their foot in the door and then eventually perhaps win you over to full mind control. So in this chapter, we wanna be focused on how to recognize uh, patterns of fallacious argument so that we're not the most vulnerable types uh, to any such efforts. Um, in the book on page 136, they quote, clinical psychologist and a cult specialist, um, Ron Burks. And he talks about that. He says here, um, <clears throat> the best way to avoid being targeted by a cult, according to the clinical counselor, cult expert Ron Burks, is to be well-informed, unafraid to ask questions. Like, who do you think is the hardest person to get caught up in a cult movement? The type of person that's a critical thinker. And he says this directly. The antidote is critical thinking. Cults do not like people that are constantly thinking and asking tough questions. So instead of being a person who just nods and says, wow, I can't believe that's true, that's amazing, the sort of person who's like, hmm, are you sure? What's your evidence? How can you really prove that? How do you know that? Um, prove it to me, don't just tell me. So we wanna be better critical thinkers. We won't be so susceptible to fallacious arguments. On one extreme, that's probably helpful for us because we don't wanna like literally involve ourselves in a cult, but more moderately, you, know, you also don't wanna be the kind of person that can be tricked by bad arguments in the consumer marketplace in the political arena, or uh, just as a, a citizen consuming media. Okay, so what are these fallacies of, of ambiguity? We got these five. And so we we'll start up here at, with the top equivocation fallacy. So equivocation is a fallacy that happens when there's a key term in an argument that is ambiguous. And so basically it's when a key term in an argument appears more than once and with different meanings, okay? Okay. Let me race to give some room on the board to create examples, but I did just want to list those at first so that you could have that in your notes as a reference. So equivocation is when a key term in an argument appears more than once, but the problem is that the meaning of the term switches midway through the argument. So it's like using a word twice over, but with two different meanings in the two places where it occurs. When that happens, we are equivocating on the meaning of the key term, and on the basis of that, the argument is bad. It's fallacious. It's equivocal. Um, let me give you an example of this that's just kind of a really straightforward example. Okay, so <clears throat> let's say the first premise just says that um, Joe is at the bank. And then in the second premise, we continue by saying a bank is a financial institution. So, therefore, not too bad, right? Can you tell me what you deduce from these premises? Apparently, the conclusion looks like it should be what statement? Joe's at the bank. Bank is financial institution. So, therefore, hence, thus, it follows that. Consequently, what's the conclusion? Let me know in the chat. He's at the bank. Bank's financial institution. So, what follows? 
to the specific conclusion that Joe is at a financial institution. Exactly, Hannah. Pretty elementary. Okay, now, let's think about how this perhaps could be a case of the equivocation fallacy. Now, here's an interesting thing about words that we use all the time as human beings talking and writing. If you think about what a word means, like what it signifies or stands for, oftentimes a single word, and we've looked at this kind of when we talk about language recently, a single word can have multiple definitions. So like if you go into a standard dictionary and you look up the meaning of a word, often you're gonna see a primary definition and then a couple of others um, as, as they become less primary. So I mean, if I looked up square, you know, primary definition would be like the four-sided polygon in geometry. Maybe after that it'd be like, oh, a, a gathering place for people like in a quad, like a town square. Maybe there's a even further on down the list meaning like informal slang to refer to someone as like not hip, like, oh, they're so square, whatever, the old 50s kind of slang. Um, so a plurality of meanings are possible even with regard to the same surface form of word with letters and sounds. It sounds like the same thing, but it doesn't mean exactly the same thing. Um, if I say I want to square up with you or something, like we're talking about, let's fight. Um, and so there's multiple meanings of the same word. Now here in this argument, it looks like there's a word perhaps that might be used in different ways. What do you think could be the uh, one word, for, for example, that is equivocating here. Which word in the uh, argument might be used with multiple meanings? Let's see what you think. What do you think? Bank, good, bank. So let's think about the word bank for a minute. We can raise the definition of equivocation up here, now we're just looking at the example for a second. Okay, so what's one meaning of bank? Well, clearly one possible meaning of bank, let's call it bank one, is financial institution. You know, like a place where you deposit money or you ask for a loan, you know, or you withdraw from one of your accounts. That's a bank, a financial institution. But there are other meanings of the same word that don't at all refer to the financial institution sense of the word. So what's another possible meaning of bank, um, you know, that's not at all involving the financial institution definition? Uh, you could also have the meaning river bank. That's a good one there. Yeah, let's do that. So let's say number two is river bank, like edge of a river. So like Mississippi River Banks. There's also the blood bank, food bank, sperm bank. So there's this bank shot in basketball. Um, but let's just s limit it to these two, just for the sake of the example. So in premise one, suppose that we say Joe's at the bank. But what we mean by that is he's fishing out there, hanging out at the river banks. In the second premise, clearly this implies the first sense of the term. But now does the conclusion follow anymore? If we've equivocated on the word bank throughout the argument, can we reach this conclusion that Joe is therefore at a financial institution? No. Only if we had used the single word bank with the same consistent meaning throughout each premise would this conclusion follow. But as we imagine the argument to commit the fallacy of equivocation, the conclusion does not follow. We've dealt in two different ways with the word bank in premise one and two. Okay, so that's like the kind of a example of a fallacy of equivocation that we're looking at. Now, this is a kind of cheesy argument, you know, no one's really going to probably engage in such an argument. But in real life, sometimes the equivocation fallacy can, can certainly trip us up and even get us into problems. Like, um, sometimes in the sex and love class that we have here at Fullerton, I'll teach some essays on the topic of like sexual consent, which is of course a big issue nowadays with the Me Too movement and all the awareness that's been generated around that. Um, and sometimes, you know, there are bad moral arguments that people make about whether consent was given for a sexual act. So like, um, consider this argument really fast. Okay. 
Okay, if, if someone consents, uh, then it is permissible to have sex with them. You know, if they're an adult, of course, and everything else. If someone consents, then it's permissible to have sex. Premise two. Um, by not uh, physically resisting me, she gave consent. And then the conclusion would appear to be, through the presentation of the fallacious argument, you can draw the conclusion, it would appear to be it was permissible to have sex with her. Okay, now maybe we can see a term in the argument here that could be uh, being equivocated on. And in this case, there's obviously much more at stake and it's a more important type of argument. But what would be the word perhaps that could be used in two different ways leading us to the conclusion through fallacy? That's consent, yeah. So consent, in premise one, the concept of consent that's being descri described is explicit consent, like saying to another person, I agree, or I want to proceed, or making it evident by means of some kind of outward token of consent. So in premise one, it's like consent explicit. But in premise two, it just says she didn't physically resist, so she gave consent. Consent in the second premise is a much weaker notion of consent. It's like failure to fight the person or cause an injury to the person. Now, is it possible for somebody to be so scared or whatever that they don't physically fight back, but they have not agreed by means of an affirmative act to have that intercourse? Yes. So by switching from a strict to a weak notion of consent, it looks like the conclusion follows, but we've changed the meaning throughout. So this is explicit, and this is like failure to fight. It only gives the outward appearance of being a good argument um, because as it's stated, it's in the form of a valid argument. But once we look into the meaning of consent that's provided in premise one and two, we see that we really can't draw the conclusion. The conclusion only follows if the same strict notion of consent is applied throughout. And in the second premise, it changes from being agreement to just not fighting the person off. Okay, so you need to be clear and aware that sometimes people make arguments and the words they're using inside are ambiguous enough that they can commit this fallacy and sometimes even have what on a first um, appearance looks to be you know, a reasonable argument. Um, let me give you another case. <clears throat> um, all right, this is mentioned in the textbook, so let me read a little bit from the book on this. Equivocation occurs when a key term in an argument is ambiguous, when it has more than one meaning, and the meaning of the term changes during the course of the argument. This is most likely to happen when the meaning of the key term is not clear from the context. Okay, so how about this? Carl and Juan are both having a discussion. Suppose these are two friends. And they're having a discussion about whether um, it's uh, allowed for a terminally ill patient to um, elect to have physician-assisted suicide. So Carl says, terminally ill patients have a right to decide how and when they want to die. But then Juan comes back and says, no way, no way, Carl. That's not true. There is no right to physician-assisted suicide in the US law. So Carl says, these patients have a right to decide. Juan says, no, they don't have any right in the law. That's not true. It looks like they're disagreeing on one point, but it might actually be because they have different understandings of which key term in this discussion. If you hear the example, what key term do you think they might be equivocating on between the two? The word right, yes, Jamie. So when Carl says patients have a right to decide how and when they want to die, he must mean that in what sense of right? Like a natural right. Like it's something that ought to be recognized and respected because it's something God-given or whatever. But when Juan says, no, there's no right to that in the law, he's using the term right 
not to express it in the moral sense, but in the legal sense, like, well, there's been no right established of that kind in the law. So in a way, they're not really having the same point. One says we ought to respect the natural right that precedes the existence of government. And the other person says, well, when governments establish laws, they haven't codified that right into the body of law. So they're using the word right in two different ways, and thus their argument is equivocating. How about this? One more from the book, okay? So they're quoting from uh, media analysis <clears throat> um, in 2010. Fox News Channel reported that the Democratic Senator Harry Reid, who he used to be the uh, Speaker of the, not the Speaker of the House, but the Senate Majority Leader when the Democrats were in the majority. He said this quote, if, you, if you're a man and you're out of work, you know, you may beat up your wife. And from this, the reporters on Fox did a whole segment where they were saying, how horrible is Harry Reid? This evil person is saying that people that are out of work, it's okay for them to beat their wife up. That's totally wrong. So shame on him. But in a way, maybe we can agree that there was equivocation on a certain word used in his original statement when it was being critiqued by the uh, Fox News. So what do you think that word could be? When he said, you know, if you're a man and you're out of work, you may beat up your wife. And then they come back and they're like, horrible. It's not okay, but he says that's something that men may do if, they, if they're poor. Well, what word do you think is being misunderstood or almost deliberately um, misinterpreted leading to this equivocation example here? What word is it there? Not beat up, no. It's, let me see, I see a few of you. Gotta have maybe more than three. But we're, there's something that's correct up there. It's not the beat up part. But Hannah, you're onto it. May. Thought some others might see that though. Isn't it not obvious? Because what does the first guy say? Harry Reid. If you're a man and you're out of work, you may beat up your wife. And then they're like, oh, that is just atrocious. Who would say that it's okay to beat up your wife if you're poor? Now, okay, may. What's one possible meaning of the term may? Let me just see you tell me that. You've heard the word, you know it. So may. We sometimes mean what by the word may? Not talking about month, <laughs> that's clever, but no, no, not May, not the month, May. It's totally, obviously that's not being referred to in this example. So, just three people that said the month, okay. But remember the example, the guy didn't talk about like April, May, June, January, whatever. He said, if you're a man and you're out of work, you may beat up your wife. Okay, so possibility is one meaning of the word. May meaning it's possible, like it may rain tomorrow. That means that it's possible that it will rain tomorrow. Like it's something that could happen. But what's another meaning of the word may that is what is being seized on in this critical rebuke of the senator's statement? That it's permissive, that you get permission, right? That someone's allowed to do it, right? So, you know, like uh, this is sometimes a subject matter of like light humor. Like a, a, a little kid will say, may I use the restroom? And then like a parent or an adult will be like, I don't know. Can you? Like, can is another example. Can I use the restroom? I don't know. Can you? Like, of course, when the child asks it, they're saying, may I be granted permission? But when someone tries to be humorous in the way they reply, they're using equivocation because they're switching the meaning of can from may I to is am I even able to do it, like, physically? Okay, so obviously when Harry Reid said that a man that's out of work may beat up their wife, he's just talking about the statistical uh, incidence of that as a frequency of the general population. So, like, poverty has a correlation with greater rates of domestic violence, yeah? So all he was saying is that is shown. If you just examine the rates at which domestic violence happens, it's likelier to happen in a household with less income. That's not saying I agree with that and that's something that's okay and fair to do. So yet, here again, we see equivocation on the word may. Um, sometimes we equivocate when we, um, use relative terms. Like if we say, um, um, Alex is tall and Alex's three-year-old daughter, uh, let, me, let me say it this way. Alex's three-year-old daughter is tall, but Alex, the father, is not tall. So does it follow that the daughter is taller than him? Tell me, uh, you heard the example. The daughter, the three-year-old, she's tall. The dad is not tall. So are we saying that she's uh, higher up than him? No. 
No, because the same word tall can be used in two senses. In the first case, when we say the three-year-old is tall, we mean tall for a three-year-old, like relative to other three-year-olds. She's a taller, you know, toddler or whatever. And when we say that the adult male is not tall, we're using tall but in the sense referred to in context of other uh, normal adult males. So he's short for an adult man, not tall. She is tall for a three-year-old child, but they can still have a variation in height where the father is taller. Okay. So, so much for equivocation and some different examples in discussion. Next, let's go on to the next one, which is amphiboly. Okay. So remember, there's five of these fallacies of ambiguity, and the second one is called amphiboly. It's a weird word. I know it reminds you of like an amphibian or something, but it's not related to that concept. So amphiboly fallacy is this. It's when there is a grammatical mistake in an argument which allows more than one conclusion to be drawn, okay? Okay, that allows for more than one conclusion to be drawn. Um, so, let's see, example given here is, all right, so now, like, here's a statement, and let's see if we can see where there's a little grammatical ambiguity in it. So it says here, Terry Schiavo's mother and her husband are on opposite sides of the battle over her life. Um, Scheibel's mother and her husband are on opposite sides of the battle over her life. So a little background. In the early 2000s, there was this woman named Terry Scheibel, and she had suffered a traumatic head injury, which put her in a coma. And what the doctors were telling her family and her husband was that there was no hope for her to ever regain consciousness, and that she was merely having her life supported by these extraordinary life support machines, but that she would never be able to regain consciousness and that they were effectively just keeping her alive as a vegetable. And then the question was, a ri was raised, what would be her wishes? Would she want to remain suspended in, in uh, living by this life support machine or would she have a preference instead to have the life support cut off and then to peacefully pass away? Um, so there was a debate, well, I don't know, dispute between um, her husband and um, well, between her mother and a husband, but here's where it's ambiguous because look at the statement again. Terry Scheibel's mother and her husband are on opposite sides of the battle over her life. So what's ambiguous in that statement? We don't know which person what word refers to. Tell me which word shows a grammatical ambiguity. Again, I'll read it. Terry Scheibel's mother and her husband are on opposite sides of the battle over her life. Well, it's the word her, yeah. Whose husband is the question? It says her, but that's ambiguous, isn't it? Because there are more than one female subject. So it could possibly be whose husband or whose husband. Tell me what are the two possible cases that this leaves ambiguous. Is it that the mother of Shivo is in a dispute with the husband of, give me the two possible um, interpretations here. Because it just says that Terry Scheibel's mom and her husband are on opposite sides of the battle over her life. So her husband could be the husband of the mother or the daughter. And it's just left completely ambiguous in the way it's written here. Now, as I'm reading it further in the text, in this statement regarding the issue of whether to remove the feeding tube from brain damaged Terry Scheibel, the ambiguous wording makes it not clear which conclusion follows. Is it Terry Scheibel's husband or her father who is taking the opposite side? Well, in fact, Terry Scheibel's husband asked to have the feeding tube removed. Her mother and father thought she was still able to regain consciousness and insisted that the feeding tubes kept in place. So sometimes language doesn't give us enough information to disambiguate a grammatically ambiguous um, argument or claim. Like for another example, 
what if I say um, Bill and Ted were hanging out and we're just having a nice conversation about his dog. Now, what's ambiguous there? What word or concept in that statement is grammatically ambiguous? His, right? Because I started by just saying that there's these two males, Bill and Ted, and they're talking about uh, his dog. But his dog doesn't specify to whom the male pronoun refers. It could be to the first named male subject or the second. And so further clarification would be required before we would really know what was being said in that statement. Um, let me see here. <clears throat> Sometimes it's done by advertisers and marketers. They'll rely on grammatical ambiguity to drive a sale or to push a product. Um, so the famous fragrance brand um, Clinique had a new scent called Happy. And in their marketing materials, they just said, wear this fragrance. Um, let me see it here. Wear it and be happy. Wear it and be happy. But we are really not sure what the force of and is here. Is and a conjunction or is it a conditional? Like, is it saying that you wear it and also separate and unrelated to that, you're going to be happy? Or is it saying wearing it will cause you to be happy as a, as a consequence? Of course, they're hoping that you interpret it the second way. But if you came back to them like a year later saying, I bought your fragrance, I wore it, and I had some of the saddest moments of my life. So didn't that count as false advertising? They would rely on the ambiguity in the original statement to say, well, you know, it wasn't clear that that's what we really meant. Um, sometimes it's done for humorous effect, this fallacy of uh, amphiboly. So they talk about a piece of dialogue from an old comedy film called Spy Hard. And one piece of dialogue says this. So the agent says, sir, we've intercepted a very disturbing satellite transmission from our listening post on the Rock of Gibraltar. And the director says, what is it? And the agent replies, oh, well, it's this really big rock sticking out of the water off the south coast of Spain. Now, this is a humorous exchange because it started with the agent reporting that we've intercepted a disturbing satellite transmission from our listening post on the Rock of Gibraltar. When the director asks, what is it? His question, what is it, could be interpreted as a question about, well, what's the content of the transmission that you intercepted? Or it could be a question about the location where the transmission was intercepted from, namely the Rock of Gibraltar. The most straightforward interpretation would be what's in the transmission. But for humorous effect, the misinterpretation is implied, and that is that it's asking about what is the Rock of Gibraltar that's referred to by the question, what's it? Okay, so just make sure that you try to be as clear as possible when you talk, speak, and write. Um, sometimes you have to be willing to ask for clarification from other people when they say something and you can't parse exactly what they meant. So to avoid falling prey to the fallacy of amphibly, sometimes it's good to ask for a restatement of the original claim or argument. Sometimes you may need to ask the person to rephrase parts of it so that we eliminate any confusion about what was intended. Okay. So that's amphibly, a second fallacy of ambiguity. Now we move to the next, which is fallacy of accent. <clears throat> okay, the fallacy of accent, accent fallacy. Um, so this fallacy occurs when the meaning of an argument or word uh, changes depending on which word or phrase in it is emphasized. So, <clears throat> let's see, I've got it here. Let me just say when. Okay. When the meaning of an argument changes. Uh, based on which word or phrase in it is emphasized. Okay. When the meaning of an argument changes based on which word or phrase in it is emphasized. 
So one thing that's interesting about language is the way that when we uh, speak, we sometimes can place a stress on certain words to kind of uh, call out the salience of that word in the statement. We also do this sometimes in writing um, by italicizing a word in a written passage. Oh yeah, so Jillian, you say, let's eat grandma. Like, um, yeah, well, right. If we say let's, like just in a monotone, let's eat grandma, you probably would just interpret it to mean let's eat with grandma. But let's eat grandma, by placing that little stress on grandma, it makes it seem that we really mean eat her, the person like a cannibal would do. Um, so the same string of words can take on a whole different quality depending on which word we accent within it. If I say this in just a monotone with no uh, inflection or stress, why did you steal my bike from me? You get the information. But if I start to just place emphasis on some of the words in that statement, I can bring out different qualities of the statement. Why did you steal my bike from me? Now by accenting and emphasizing the word bike, it's like I'm trying to impress upon you that of all the things you could have taken from me, why the bike though? Like the one thing I love the most. Or if I say, why did you steal my bike from me? Now accenting and emphasizing the word you makes it seem as though what I'm trying to indicate is of all the people, I might have thought other people would take my bike, but you, really? I thought that we had a closer relationship than that. You know, why did you steal the bike from me? Like as if I expect you to be a bike thief but really me, I mean, there's so many other victims that you could have chosen. So, you know, a single sentence by emphasizing or accenting as the fallacy is called different parts of the sentence can transform the meaning. Sometimes this is a bad thing though, when um, it creates ambiguity as to what the person meant. So let's see here, there's an example in the book. It's presented as like a bit of conversational exchange. So imagine that you've got a mother and a daughter. The mother's mad at the daughter because she gets home and basically the daughter has uh, lit fire to the garden shed and burned it to the ground. So that's not good. The mother comes to the daughter having seen the damage and says, oh, come on. Didn't I say to you so many times, don't play with matches? And now the daughter comes back and says, right. Thing is, though, I wasn't playing with matches. I mean, this was serious business. I was like setting things on fire. It's an act of arson. How is that a game to you? I mean, this isn't, this isn't playing, playing. This isn't funny. Okay, so what do you think is the emphasized accented word, which is somewhat deliberately mis misinterpreting the mother's original warning or rule? The accent leading to the misinterpretation is based on the word playing, right? So she accents and emphasizes playing. I wasn't playing, mom. I was doing a science experiment with matches or something. Now, what the mother meant though, as we all should know, when she said, don't play with matches, is not do whatever you want with matches unless it amounts to like a fun game. It's just don't touch the matches. Don't use them, don't ignite them, stay away from the matches pretty much. And just a casual way of saying that is don't play with matches. So the accent has led to the misinterpretation. Another example from our book. Um, so students looking at the school newspaper and it says there that the administration is gonna crack down on off-campus drinking. So he says this to his friend. Wow, well that's cool. I'm glad that they're gonna crack down on off-campus drinking because that means that they're gonna be having no problem with me bringing a flask to school and drinking on campus. So what was the accent there? the accent was placed on off-campus drinking, as if when the rule was issued, they meant to say, as long as you drink on campus, it's okay, but off-campus is where we have a problem. Obviously, that's not the policy. But by placing the stress, the inflection, the accent on off-campus, it conveys that misunderstanding. Um, okay, now Jillian, I see your example. I wanna make better sense of it but maybe you're trying to indicate that that's a statement that could have different meanings depending on accent. Um, juggle knives with the stove on and the front door wide open. Well, maybe you can elaborate more, but I, I think that's probably what you meant. It would take me a moment though to kind of catch up to speed and start playing with the accents there. Juggle knives with the stove on and the front door wide open. Mm, I don't know though if that's gonna lead to many misinterpretations. 
okay, what you say here. It's like when the parents tell you not to play with knives or, okay, I got you. Perfect. Yes, exactly. That's the real force of the statement. Correct. And the misinterpretation is effective through the act of the accenting. Um, here's another case, okay? While we're on the whole thing of like parents and children, right, and rules that parents give their kids. Parents sees the child hanging out with a friend, but they don't like this friend. They think that it's like a troublemaker, bad influence. I don't know. I always thought that was kind of not nice though growing up because aren't we all just kids? I mean, if you're going to say I'm friends with people that are bad kids, what are you saying? These are children. I mean, how bad could they be? Anyway, though, back to what I was saying. So they say, I don't want that kid in this house anymore. It's like, oh, mom, come on. We're friends. I'm sorry. No, it's not going to happen. Let me just make it clear to you. Starting today, I don't ever want them to come through the front door of this house again. Okay? And where do you think this is leading? Okay, so like a week later, mom comes home. The friend is there in the room with her child. Starts scolding the child. What are you doing? How, how much clearer do I have to be? I thought I told you what? And then the child says, ah, yes, mom, I know what you said. What you said was, what do you think? See if you catch wind of what I'm implying here. Because she said, I don't ever want this guy to come through the front door of this house again. But he's back in the house. So what is the child's response when the mom starts scolding them because they violated the rule? The child says, I know what you said, mom. The reason they're here is because why? Really? No? Nothing? Okay. Don't come in the front door, but they came in from any other door. Exactly. You're like, yeah, so what you literally said was you don't ever want them to come through the front door again. And so I heard you. That's why they crawled in through the window. I mean, you said don't let them in through the front door. Yeah, so now we're emphasizing accenting front door as if the mom's statement was intended to mean let them in any which way, just not through the front door entrance. Clearly, that's not what the mom's in, uh, statement implied. Through the force of this accent, it's been taken out of context. Okay, now some of these are just silly, fun games, and that's fine. But, you know, there can also be cases where um, misinterpreting a statement due to the force of an accented word or phrase can have bigger consequences. Um, like they talk here about the concept of proof texting, which is a technique and a tactic that cults will sometimes use to recruit people to their ranks. So, you know, a lot of people, of course, already have existing religious beliefs, and sometimes cults will try to use that as leverage to get their foot in the door and to then be able to, um, you know, influence you with their message. So one thing they'll sometimes do is claim that passages of, like, say, the Christian Bible are actually uh, revealing facts that the cult also believes. So, for example, in Luke 14.33, it says, Whosoever of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. And so Jim Roberts from the Brethren, trying to recruit new people, would say, this is the reason that you have to abandon all your friends and family and just join the Brethren, because it says right there in the Bible, read it, it says, whosoever of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. What do you think that means? If you don't forsake everything that you have, then you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. That means you've got to join the Brethren and cut, cut ties with your family and your social circle. Obviously, by placing an emphasis on forsaketh not all that he hath, this becomes right subject matter for the proponent of the cult to fill that in with information that's not accurate to the religious message. Or they can say, doesn't it say there in the Bible, be your brother's keeper? Be your brother's keeper. Who do you think we are? We're the brethren. It's, it's talking about us. So see, don't be so scared of our cult. It's something that Jesus and the Bible already anticipated in the scriptures. But obviously, that would be manipulative and fallacious. So yet again, examples on examples of uh, accent-type fallacies. The key thing that links all these examples together is that in each case, there is a statement whereby accenting or emphasizing, placing a stress on certain words or phrases in the statement or the passage of writing um, affects a misinterpretation of the original message content. That's can, something that can happen all the time, so that's the accent fallacy. Okay, now two more, um, for today anyway. And these two are kind of like a package deal in a way because they, um, they're very much similar except in two opposite directions. So here, let me tell you what they are. There is the composition and the division fallacy. So start with fallacy of division. Okay, fallacy of division. Here's what that is. Um, it is a situation where you 
erroneously infer from the characteristics of a whole group to characteristics about a member of the group, okay? So when you falsely assume or imply that just because a group has a certain feature that every member of the group does too, okay? <clears throat> Okay, so when you erroneously infer that every member of a group has a feature that the whole group has. Um, you could put it another way. You could also say that it is an erroneous inference that if a group has a certain feature, that each member of it also has it. Erroneous means in error. Um, it's an adverb for done in error. So this is an inference that is made in error, and the inference is that every member of a group must have the same feature that the whole group has as a whole. The format of the division fallacy can be stated in a, um, in a schematic way. So here's the form of division fallacy. It takes on the appearance of an argument, and it looks like this, group G, has characteristic C. Okay, and then um, X is a member of group G. So the conclusion that follows would appear to be that um, X, the individual, has that characteristic C. Okay, so um, it's basically whenever a person wrongly assumes that if a whole has a feature, that all the parts which make up the whole also have to have that feature. So like, for example, this is the United States and this is the wealthiest country in the world. So looking at our country as a big group, as a nation, we have the characteristic wealthiest nation. So now you are one member of the group United States. So what would be the fallacious conclusion to draw then, according to the division fallacy? The United States is the wealthiest country. Joe or Jane student is a member of the United States. And therefore, the conclusion is derived that what? You follow me, right? Just let's see what you have. So, okay, that, they're, that you're the wealthiest person, right? So this is the wealthiest country. You're a member of the country, so you're the wealthiest person. But that's certainly not true. There can be a very wealthy country, but not every single member of it is fantastically wealthy, right? So that's a situation where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The whole, taken as a whole, has a quality that the individual parts do not. Okay, um, how about this? This is in the book as well. Men generally as a group are taller than women, right? I mean, we know that. I mean, just, that's a fact. By a average, statistical average of male height is taller than women. So men are taller than women. Now, um, Kevin Hart um, is a man. And so what should be the conclusion of that division fallacy? Men are taller than women. Kevin Hart is a member of the group man. And so, therefore, conclusion, what would that be? That he's taller than the average woman, exactly. 
but you know, um, I guess I could have picked an even shorter person, Danny DeVito or somebody. That's actually in the textbook, Danny DeVito is the example. But you understand that just because men overall are taller than women doesn't mean that every single member of the group male is that way. Okay, so yet again, a division fallacy. Um, <clears throat> the hotel is small. Room 101 is one of the rooms of the hotel. So room 101 is small. But that doesn't really follow, does it? Just because the hotel itself, the whole thing is small, doesn't mean that every part of it is. You can have a big room in a small hotel and vice versa. Say the hotel is large. Room 101 is one of the rooms of the large hotel. So room 101 is large, not necessarily. You can definitely have a large hotel made of a lot of small rooms, okay? Let's try another one. Me, Dr. Vulich, I'm visible to the naked eye, meaning that you don't need a microscope or anything to just see me. Just looking with your own natural vision, you can see me quite well. Now, I'm made up out of uh, atoms, right? Just like you and everything else in space. So Vulich is visible to the naked eye, and um, here's an atom taken out of his body. So it's a member of the group of atoms that form the body. If I'm visible to the naked eye, and this atom X is an atom of me, should we draw the conclusion that the atom is visible to the naked eye? No. Composed together, all of the little atoms form one macroscopic object that can easily be seen. But the whole has a feature that we don't see in every individual part. Namely, it's large enough formed as a whole to see by the eye, but the parts, the minuscule infinitesimal parts need a microscope, an electron microscope to be seen. Okay, um, we can talk about athletic performance too. Uh, let's see. The Los Angeles Lakers um, are the best team in basketball right now because they just won the championship yesterday. The Lakers, right? Um, now, who's a member of the Los Angeles Lakers that's not a very good player? Anybody got a view about that? I mean... Well, there's J.R. Smith. He didn't really get much time, did he, throughout the playoffs? I don't know any NBA fans. He's a legendary three-point shooter. But uh, Kuzma, Danny Green, yeah, they kind of blew the game five, didn't they? I don't know. I think Danny Green might be the one that's a little bit of a weaker link than Kuzma. Kuzma has his moments. So let's just talk about Danny Green. So the Lakers are the best team in the NBA. Danny Green is a member of the Lakers, so he's one of the best players in the NBA. Does that really follow? No. You see, you can have a team that's a great team considered as a collective, but that does not mean that each single individual that's a member of the team is, is the same as the team described as a unit. Okay, so that's division fallacy. Caruso greater than MJ? Wow, okay. Yeah, well, I'm not the biggest MJ fanboy like a lot of people. I think LeBron's the greatest, but, you know, we've all got opinions on basketball, I guess. So anyway, yeah, so that's a division fallacy. Um, sometimes it happens in cases of stereotyping as well. There's a mention in the book of that. So I don't want to throw around any like uh, negative stereotypes, which are bad. But like, let's say a positive stereotype. Many people think of the Canadians as just friendly, um, which overall, I guess, is sort of true, um, having been there a few times and needing some help on occasion from random people. So anyway, suppose we say Canadians are friendly, just the group, Canadians, friendly people. Um, Derek is from Ottawa, so Derek is friendly. Um, we don't know necessarily in every single case that a randomly selected member of a population with a reputation for being friendly or something else is the same way. So those are all division fallacies, guys. Now, if you can understand that, composition is gonna be pretty easy also, because it's just the same, just switching it around, okay? I honestly don't wanna disrespect Caruso with the headband and all that, he's got a lot of flair. But, uh, you know what I mean? I guess you need to have role players. Anyways, composition fallacy. So the fallacy of composition is just in the opposite direction. It's when you make an erroneous inference um, that the whole must have a feature that is seen in the parts. Okay? So... <clears throat>
So composition fallacy, an erroneous inference that a characteristic of just a single member of a group or members of the group is also therefore a characteristic of the whole group considered as a, as a total, not necessarily true. And um, the form of the composition fallacy is kind of like just the converse of the division fallacy. We start with the claim that um, uh, X is a member of group G, so X is a member of group G, X has characteristic C, and therefore the, the fallacious conclusion here would be that um, group G, the whole group, has the same characteristic that the member has namely C. Okay, so um, the rooms in the hotel are small. So like room 101 is a room of the hotel. Room 101 is small. So therefore the hotel is small, not necessarily. It could be a large hotel with some small rooms. Um, a cell swabbed off the side of my cheek um, cannot be seen without a microscope. And since the cells are the elements that form my whole body, then I can't be seen without a microscope. Obviously, that's false. So a composition fallacy happens when you attribute a quality to the whole based on a quality that is seen in just a part. Sometimes the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And in situations like that, we can have a, a case where there's a feature of a member but not in the whole group. Um, let's see. Um, I used to use the example of like players in sports too. I mean, you could say like LeBron James is the best basketball player and he is a member of the Lakers, so the Lakers are the best team. That might not be the best example now because they kind of are the best team if they won the championship. But um, maybe take that last year in Cleveland when they were getting destroyed by the Warriors in the finals. You know, there's still a reasonable argument that he was the most talented player on the planet, but that didn't make his team the best team necessarily, and they certainly weren't, I guess, right there. Um, yeah. How about this? Sodium and, chlor uh, and chloride are um, extremely unstable just as elements individually. So that must mean that sodium chloride, the combination of the two, is very unstable. But that's just definitely false. NaCl, sodium chloride, is the scientific name for table salt. And salt is a staple of all of our diets, so it's certainly not something that's extremely dangerous, unstable, or explosive. But the two component parts of it, without the supplementation of the other, actually are by themselves. Um, let's see, other examples. Mm. Uh, yeah, so like, say that there's a member of a group that has a feature that's not seen in the whole group overall. Um, Colin Kaepernick um, is all about social justice. Colin Kaepernick plays for the San Francisco 49ers. I mean, I don't think he plays for anybody right now, but he used to. And then you could have said, oh, so the 49ers as a group are all about promoting social justice, but not necessarily. I think that he was kind of waived in a way and blacklisted from the league for his um, political stance, even though it was kind of a righteous stance and it seems like a lot of the country's moved in his direction since then. Um, so composition fallacies all around. Can you think of another case? Let me get one from you guys while we're all here together really fast. Oh, is Coos better than Barkley? Well, different day, different discussion, but Barkley was MVP, you know, round mound and rebound. He was great at rebounding. And he, had, he had his prime. Did make the NBA Finals that one year. And he was, you know, the leader of the team. But I am yeah, not the biggest fan of old Charles. But yeah, go, go ahead. A, a composition fallacy example. So it's easy enough. Just plug in to the points here. So, okay. Oh, a specific tourist. That would be a good one. Yeah. So stereotyping can proceed from this. There was this American. And he was so rude and nasty. So Americans are just rude people. That would be a good example for sure. Um, and you could also, I guess, Jillian run it in that same kind of way, talking about 
the stereotype of a whole group based on experiences with the couple. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, stereotyping can be seen in both division and composition. So in division, it's like if the stereotype is relied upon, then the conclusion is that a member of the stereotypical group has the features associated with the stereotype. In composition fallacy, it would be to build a stereotype from the behavior of particular members of groups, um, both of which are generally you know, not reliable ways of arguing or thinking. Um, let's see here, maybe there's some examples in the set of uh, problems on page 140 and 41. Um, okay. You're a bad person because you're a bad student. I mean, so that would be equivocation on the word bad, using moral badness as um, as something that's ambiguous between moral badness and like academic performance, good and badness. Um, okay, here we go. The sign on the door says, no animals allowed. I guess we'll have to find another place for lunch since we're humans and humans are clearly animals. So you could think of this as perhaps equivocation on the term animal or perhaps accent fallacy I could accept if it's like no animals allowed. Okay, so if humans are animals by means of the accent changing the force of the posted sign. Um, okay. The black rhino is heading towards extinction. So the black rhinos at the Cincinnati Zoo must be heading towards extinction. What is that one? The black rhino species is, is going extinct. So the rhinos at the zoo must be going extinct. What's that? Got five options. Is it equivocation, amphibole, accent, composition, or division? The black. It's division, exactly, because it starts off with a feature of the whole category of the species. The species at large is going extinct. But that doesn't mean that like one member of the species that's being protected in a zoo is itself going extinct. Extinction is a property of a, of a group, not of an individual member of the group. Um, okay, how about this? God created man in his own image, but you're a woman. Therefore, you aren't created in God's image. This could be equivocation on which word man. Because what are multiple meanings of the word man? Well, one meaning of man in the sort of old timey way of using it, I don't know if this is the most current uh, trend anymore, but people would just refer to humanity, the human race as man, like mankind. Uh, but then people also, of course, use man as a reference to, you know, the gender, the biological gender of male or whatever. So God created man in his own image, but your woman is, is interpreting the word man on only one of its possible interpretations and could be, of course, Equivocated. Um, okay. The people of Liechtenstein have the highest personal income of people anywhere in the world. Therefore, Liechtenstein is the richest nation in the world. That would be um, a composition fallacy. Because just because the individual citizens have all this wealth doesn't mean that there's like basically enough of them for them to amount to a country with that as having the status of wealthiest country in the world. Of course, if you know anything about world geography, Liechtenstein is very small. But it's a small country of very rich people. So you can have a lot of rich people in a small country. And since the limitations of size and space, it's not going to be like the wealthiest country in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, here we go. Our town hall says it's giving out parking permits to fish at Warden's Pond. But that's ridiculous. Why would a fish need a parking permit? So this one's actually amphibole because we're not sure what the grammatical status of the word fish is. Is it a verb or is it a noun? You, you know what I mean? Our town hall says it's giving out parking permits to fish at Warden's Pond. But why would fish need a parking permit? So the mistaken humorous second sentence proceeds from the grammatical ambiguity about the term fish as it's given in the original posted sign um, or in the original message contained in the first sentence. Um, when the grammatical category of the word or what its reference is, is the ambiguous thing, then that's amphiboly. Um, when it's the meaning of the word that's ambiguous, then that's equivocation. 
Okay, how about this one? One more. My parents used to get into arguments all the time and they ended up getting divorced. Critical thinking teaches people how to make arguments. Therefore, if you want a happy marriage, do not take a class in critical thinking. What do you think that could be? What do you think that could be? My parents used to get into arguments all the time. And they ended up getting divorced. Critical thinking teaches people how to make arguments. Therefore, if you want a happy marriage, don't sign up for a course in critical thinking. Which of the five fallacies we learned today could that be? Oh, are dad jokes fallacies of accent, Miguel? Interesting question. Uh, I got to think more about the genre of, of jokes that those are. Sebastian, no, it's not the vision. No. It's a different one, so you've got four more options. It's also not composition, no. It's neither of those. Listen to it. My parents used to get into arguments all the time, and they ended up getting divorced. Critical thinking teaches people how to make arguments. So therefore, if you want a happy marriage, don't sign up for a class in critical thinking. It is equivocation, yes. Good, Hannah. Why? On what word? There's a key word that animates that whole passage, and it's the word that's being equivocated on, and it's which one. This ties back into an early discussion that we had on the first day of class. So I kind of wanted to go over that one last time before we end right now. It is equivocation, but on which word do you think? Wait for it. What is it? Just let me know. You have the answer, but not the reason. You have to have the reason if you give the answer. Otherwise, what, is it a guess? I'll say it again. My parents used to get into arguments all the time and they ended up getting divorced. Critical thinking teaches people how to make arguments. Therefore, if you want a happy marriage, don't sign up for a class in critical thinking. Equivocation on the word, argument, yes. So what's one meaning of the word argument? Well, one meaning of the word, unfortunately, the one that seems to have seeped most into popular consciousness is the negative connotation. Arguments, you know, angry, harsh, yelling, and making fun of people and getting offended, fighting, yeah. But argument in the logical sense, which is in fact its true sense, is just to present a claim and defend it with reasons, to have premises that lead to a conclusion. So yes, critical thinking teaches you how to make debate-type arguments that are like just logical arguments based on evidence. When the person says, my parents got into arguments and got divorced, they're just referring to like fighting and so on, yelling and getting nasty with each other. So another lesson in what arguments really are. Okay, now Jocelyn, do we have a homework assignment coming up soon? Yes, but not just yet. Uh, I'm gonna continue grading a little more and I think the next homework is not gonna be due for at least uh, over a week. And it's not, um, the next homework assignment has to do with the next batch of fallacies that we're gonna learn on Wednesday. So I couldn't really assign it until after the Wednesday lesson. After the next meeting though, I'll give you guys instructions on it and it'll be due in about a week or so. Okay, so thanks everyone again. We had a good meeting, I think. Um, like I told you, I'm continuing to work through the midterms, but the other two things are graded, and so I'll let you know when the midterms are done. It'll just be a couple of more um, days. All right then, guys. Have a great day then, and uh, take it easy. I'll see you back in uh, 48 hours or so. All right, bye-bye.